So the reason we have two Chinas is actually because of the one China policy. <laughs> You're not wrong, are you? You're not wrong. I guess this is going to be the China video that everyone wants to see. Are you excited? Uh, yeah, sure. And we should probably mention, though, that just because we think something is going to happen doesn't mean we necessarily want it to happen. Like, for instance, in the last episode, I was mentioning how I think Canada could fall apart. And some people thought I wanted that to happen and that I didn't like Canada. Are you telling me you don't hate Canada? Are you saying that the maple leaf is not your, you know, daily thing that you burn on the way to the bathroom each morning? No, um, my actual opinion on this is that I, it, I just don't think that the whole is more than the sum of the parts when it comes to Canada. So like, I like the parts of Canada, but I don't like how they have to combine with each other. Yeah, I, I think uh, unlike a lot of countries, Canada is more a loose collection of places that has a very good branding for the outside world, but doesn't seem to add as much value as it destroys at the same time. Mm -hmm. And anyway, we actually did just have an election in that there was a thing where the popular vote was not the same as the election result, which is similar to what happened in 2016 in the America's election, where the blue party in both cases- Yeah, I was gonna say you had a reverse America. You, yeah. You had a reverse America happen. Yeah. Do you know the reason? I mean, I guess you live in Canada. Do you know the reasons why? Um, so the blue party in Canada got a very high margin in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and things were more even everywhere else. Which Where they already had won all the seats, right? Yeah, so they already had those seats. So having a higher margin did not result in any more seats being gained. So it's actually for the exact same reason, kind of, as it happened in America. Because what happened in America was the Blue Party won California by a really large margin of like 30%. And that was not worth more than yeah, and winning it by like 1%. In both cases, the Blue Party won the popular vote, but did not win the like most power in the election. Yeah, it, it goes to show that, um, especially in a federalized country, it might seem smart to just get more votes. But if you get more votes in the areas you've dominated already, it literally adds nothing. Uh, and that's how you can win the popular vote without even coming close to winning a majority of seats. Like 121 seats, which is the number uh, the conservatives won, or the blue party won. Uh, it is like, it's almost, it's almost a third. Like it's... It's wild how little that can be because their vote is too concentrated in areas they already won, right? Yeah. And so because of this, it might not be Quebec that causes Canada to fall apart. It could be the West that causes it to fall apart. This is because the more you align towards Quebec to try to keep it in, the more you alienate the West. And so you can't really have them both at the same time. Counterpoint. Yes. Counterpoint here. So if you look at California, the exact example we're using in the reverse, it's funny because they're both Western states kind of having opposite, having very strong blue results compared to the uh, the red uh, found to the east of it. Of it. Um, but if you look at California, despite their huge uh, blue party swing, there isn't a Californian independence movie. There isn't a, a falling apart of America happening from it. It just kind of is accepted as like, oh, that sucks. It was mostly just a internet thing in both cases that the West was talking about separation the same way California talked about separation. It was nothing official yet. Uh -huh. Calexit. Yeah, Calexit and we Wexit. Wexit. <laughs> There's no way Wexit is a real thing. The Saskatchewan Premier at the time of the Quebec referendum has stated that he had secretive talks about what would happen in the case that Quebec actually chose to leave. One w option that could be is just to stay in. The other option they looked into was splitting with the rest of the West to form their own country. And the third option they thought of was joining America. While admitting that this is the thing that happened, he also said that he didn't like it. But in the case that Canada was going to fall apart, he was thinking about what was best for Saskatchewan. So when one part of Canada falls apart, there is a precedent that other parts will follow suit. And what you're saying is Wexit is a real possibility. You're a you're a Wexit believer. I think it's just talk at the moment. It could become something more if, if things develop that way. So all of our chaos that comes about because of our elections is something that China really likes. Gotta tie it back into China. Because they get to point to us as an example of like a saying, hey, you see that democracy thing? It's not working out for them that well. So maybe you should continue to support the Communist Party. Have uh, Do you know that China has a lot of very local democracies? 
but they deliberately make them as corrupt as possible. They try to make them, you know, like uh, on such small levels that people go, wow, if democracy can't work for 500 people in this small village, then how can it work for a country of 1.3 billion? Long live the CPC. And I think it's a really good strategy, honestly. Yeah, that is part of their strategy. They point to the corrupt local officials to state that the Central Communist Party is the one who is tackling this corruption. And thus it, it makes people like the the central government over their local government. Yeah, it's, it's definitely true that you can... Yeah, make issues and then solve them and then seem way better than if you just didn't create the issue. China is actually a very weird country in the sense that they are very localized while centralized at the same time, which is that tends to be a, a thing that's common with India in a way because they're both really large countries. One thing that is interesting to note is China has this thing called the Huku system, which is essentially like a citizenship for each province, where if people move to a different province, they're kind of like illegal immigrants in their own country. So it's funny because this is the exact system the USSR used. Um, they had localized pa pa passports to each region. And even to this day, Russia has internal passports, which is something I don't think any other country has. Like to move within your own country, there is a form of ID that you need. And I wonder if it's a coincidence or not that the two largest communist, in air quotes, countries both use this system of kind of limiting people's movements. Because it seems like the opposite of the stated point of communism to some extent, no? Like, it seems like a big... Well, that is how communism usually ends up happening. But, um, but like, yeah, before communism, China did actually have some form of hukou system. So it's kind of a more of a, chi of a socialism of Chinese characteristics type thing. Uh, oh, I love socialism of Chinese characteristics my favorite type of socialism. But um, is the hukou system still in place to this day? Yes, it's still in the system to its day. It's less rigid than before. You can change your hukou if you pay a fee. Really? Wait, no way. That's insane. That's silly. That's crazy. You, you can change your what? You can buy citizenship from the other provinces? Well, you can buy citizenship in Canada. Oh, really? How much? If you invest a certain amount of money, you can become part of the investor class immigration, which allows you to become an immigrant, which eventually lets you have a citizenship. Controversial opinion here, like wildly controversial with like both political wings, but because the UK has a similar system, I think I know the amount, it's in the millions, it's somewhere between one and five million. But I think if you're gonna put five million into a country, uh, you should sell citizenship to anyone. Like, you're not... It, what does citizenship really have value as anyway? Not too much. Might as well sell it, right? So when China was more communist, the hukou system was a lot more rigid. And like, for instance, there was even rural hukus and urban hukus. And this distinction was important as communism was very pro-proletariat rather than pro-peasant. And thus the proletariats were favored over the rural hukou. So having an urban hukou, even if in the same province, like during the famines, for instance, would have given you priority in that situation. Wait, they gave food based on the level of these passports during famines. Yeah, like the welfare system was given preferential treatment to the urban resident. This was something that the Soviet Union obviously did too, as well, because in during like famines, they would take grain from the rural areas and send it to the cities because that was where their base of support was. Wait, you think, wait, it was, it was for support reasons. I thought their logic was always a bit more like, you know, uh, the people in the cities are the ones who I thought it was like an ideological decision to basically say, screw the people in the countryside, they can do what they want. Oh yes, it was ideological. Okay. Because communism is for the proletariat. So they were ideologically in favor of them. But th the thing about that is that if you're ideologically in favor of a group, that group will also be your support base. So there's practical reasons as well as ideological reasons that mesh into each other. Okay. Oh, and they use the justification of, man, this is a subject I'm so outside my depth on. <laughs> <laughs> like communism is the fundamentals of communism are just I, I literally I can't even properly follow this one I feel like without being like okay yeah this, I'm just keeping up with that so I, I think all of this food was if you were in a city you were worthy of a lot more uh, food and therefore you know like therefore the city people did better the proletariat is this one of the reasons China has so many a ridiculous number of large cities like you know, a, a country's largest city is going to be smallest, the, smaller than China's 35th largest city most of the time, right? Like, they have so many ridiculously big cities. I mean, that's kind of because China's just so populated that the cities are, as a result, so much larger than everyone else. I think that plays a lot more into it than the policy. 
because India also has really large cities. Uh, nowhere near the size of China's, right? Well, China is like 10 years ahead of India because India had this thing called the, the license Raj, where India actually did a, like a kind of democratic socialism. And that worked as about as good as our authoritarian socialism, except without the, um, all the killings. Oh, my favorite system. So it didn't work, but it wasn't like as bad. So, but they, they ended their socialist experiment 10 years after China did. So they're 10 years behind China. <laughs> Are you trying to imply that socialism is the past? Because I find that offensive. <laughs> You're gonna be careful of how you respond to this one. Well, um... <laughs> well... Actually, no. Socialism is the future. Every society goes through four modes of production. The slave society, feudalism, capitalism, socialism, which then becomes communism when the state withers away because the state still does all the same things it was doing. It's just its political character disappears because people won't perceive it as being the state because political power is only when one class uses it to oppress another class. And thus when everyone is a proletariat in the same class, they will not perceive the state as political and therefore won't be a state anymore. And thus it will be communist utopia. So as long as we all make the exact same amount of money, have the exact same skin tone, all live in the exact same place with no differences in opinion ideologies, then what you're saying is perfect communism can exist. Yes. Oh, I am so excited for that, you know, true communism uh, phase. Uh, you better believe I'm going to go protest for that right now. But so China is working towards that right now because notably it's one of the biggest countries that kind of pretends it's one people group most of the time, right? Yeah. I can't name another 1.3 billion people that claim to all be the same. Yeah. So India is the only other country that could be like that, but they are very much not the same people. Like in every possible way that you could imagine people being divided, people in India are divided. And they even invented new ways for people to be divided with the caste system. Oh, I love the caste system. Love the caste system. You know, in my dream version of communism, we're going to keep the caste system. Like, I just, <laughs> I feel like we need more ways to discriminate against people. That's the problem with the modern day, right? Like, there just aren't enough unique ways you can pick on someone and be like, hey, you're less than me or more than me. You know, we need, we need, we need more ways to rank people and have goods and bads. And a good caste system could really help with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you were ready for that. <laughs> this, we're going a bit off the rails, I feel like. <laughs> okay, so... So, it... But anyway... <laughs> yeah, try. China is not actually that unified as it pretends it is. This is a good analogy that I made, is that it's kind of like as if the French and Italians still thought they were both Romans because they all use, still use the written form of Latin. That'd be kind of like what China is. The Han are considered one group, but in this group of the Chinese language, there is languages which you can speak to each other and nobody could understand what you're talking about, even though you're both speaking Chinese. And really what it should be considered is a language family, like the Romance language family of the Sinindic languages, where Mandarin is one of them and Cantonese is another. And I think it's called Wu dialect of Shanghai is its own. Uh huh. Etc. Yeah, that Shanghaiese is a and real. These, are, these people. Yeah. Shanghaiese. Shanghaiese. Yes. Yeah. And so Mandarin is like based on the Beijing Beijing dialect. So it's kind of like it's kind of like if you have French and Italians claiming to both be Roman. I mean, they do both use the Latin alphabet, do they not? I think you'll find that Frenches and Italians are kind of like they are both the same people group if you really think about it. Because isn't Latin America a place? Are they not called Latinos because they use Latin-based or languages? So really what you're telling me is that French people and Italians are the same. That's the lesson I'm learning here. Yeah, I suppose they are. <laughs> if we're, we're, I suppose they are if we're using our new Chinese overlords way of determining things. Uh, now's a good time to mention this uh, podcast was brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends, the greatest game by... <laughs> <laughs> did you know that that's a Chinese game? I don't know if you did. I didn't know that, but I do know that apparently everybody on YouTube is um, sponsored by them. Uh, I can reveal this because it's a geography podcast I'm sure they're not going to listen to, but do you want to know how much they offered me for a video? You'll, you'll be like, oh yeah, okay, I would take that money too, I feel like. So if I tell you, you've got to immediately say yes or no if you would sell out to the Chinese government in exchange for this amount of money, okay? Okay. Immediately. Okay. Okay, so in exchange for two videos, 5,000 US dollars. No. What? That's not even that much. <laughs> really? Oh, man. Am I, am I underselling myself? Should I ask for more? 
yeah, you should definitely ask for more. If you're going to sell out to the Chinese government, you should at least be getting like paid like at least a myriad, <laughs> like, which is 10,000. Is, is 10,000 a myriad? Is that is that a fact? Yeah. I think you'll find, oh, wow, a unit of 10,000. It also means a countless number. So it's somewhere between 10,000 and countless. Although I guess you could argue 10,000 is countless, depending on how long you have to count. Huh. <laughs> what a wacky thing. Anyway, no, um... China is where all the good brand deals do actually come from. They totally gave me a free phone, which is why I support the Chinese government's position on all these things. And I think that France and Italy basically are the same country, just like how Beijing, Shanghai, and, you know, Tibet might as well be the same place. I mean, besides geographic differences, what's the difference? They're all on China time, are they not? Yeah, it's not like in Xinjiang. They have their own local time, which is two hours behind Beijing time. Nobody uses that. Not a single person. Nope, they use China time because China is one country with one time zone. And, you know, geography might dictate that they should have, what, three time zones? Like, <laughs> maybe a bit more, four even? I think maybe the f most far eastern parts could be in, like, a Japan time. But no, we can't do that. Those are imperial. <laughs> no imperialist time zones. Okay, just one, one great grand China time zone. You know, actually, um, I know this is going to sound like I'm shilling for the Chinese government, and I always am, just to clarify. But... I, I actually think one time zone for a whole country is not a terrible idea. It's just you've got to set it to the furthest west point, you know? Not the furthest east. I think if the whole of America mm. used California time, that wouldn't be such a tragedy. I think if all of Canada used uh, Vancouver time, then uh, whatever it's called, British Columbian, like... I think it's the same time zone, actually. Wouldn't be such a tragedy for you, would it? Like, if this was three hours earlier in the day... How bad would your life be ruined? I think it should be in the middle, don't you think? I mean, oh yeah, the, uh, so the middle, I, but I like I a little bit west of the middle. A little bit west of the middle. I don't know why there, there's a bias towards things being to the west. It's because of daylight savings being a thing that people I don't understand why enjoy. there would be. Well, I mean, okay, so you know every country that ends daylight savings? They don't end it, they end on the summertime. They have permanent daylight savings, which is the same as having no daylight savings oh, okay. and moving your country west, right? Why don't you just adjust your work schedule one hour behind and therefore noon can actually be at noon? Ho, 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 you think that I can... <laughs> you think I should change me? No, we should change the clocks for the entire country. What is this craziness of like, just wake up slightly earlier or just go to bed slightly later. No, that's craziness. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a law passed and I'm gonna change the clocks for the entire world by an hour, except it's gonna be different in each hemisphere. And that's so much more logical than your stupid idea of just change your work schedule. Oh man, these silly ideas you come up with, man. These silly ideas. Well, the just change your work schedule is kind of like what happened in Xinjiang, where the people there, they adopted the time. They, they changed their work schedule such that they follow the sun rather than Beijing time. Which, as as you know, there can only be one sun in China, and it's in Beijing, <laughs> not in the sky. It's in Beijing. Yeah, I was going to say it must hurt to be like a Beijing government official and realize that the sun has more power than you in Xinjiang. <laughs> So speaking of Beijing, this is this is one of those nerdy airport codes that like 1% of the audience can appreciate. But do you know why the Beijing airport, uh, the airport code is P-E-K? Because it's called Peking before. Uh huh. And do you know the story behind Peking and Beijing? Would you like to be wowed? I do not know the details. Uh, it's because Beijing and Peking both mean the same thing, which is Eastern Capital. It's just Peking or Peking was the old version, right? Yeah. Is it Eastern Capital? I'm gonna make sure it's East. <laughs> oh no, it's Northern. It's northern capital. Oops. Tokyo Tokyo is actually also called Eastern Capital. It is, yeah. That's what's it actually is it Edo that is Eastern Capital and Tokyo. No wait, yeah, Tokyo. Is Tokyo just Japanese for Eastern Capital? Kyo is capital because Kyoto was the old capital. And so Tokyo is Eastern Capital, I think. I like that. Okay, so Peking just meant Northern Capital. Beijing also just means northern capital, but it goes back to that dialect thing you're saying where you can take entirely different words, but they mean the same thing because different parts of the Chinese language, which is one language as our Chinese overlords, of course, would agree, I think. But yeah, fun fact. So that means Peking duck is actually Beijing duck, if you've ever had that. Yeah. Is that a big thing there? And it's called northern capital because the north-south division is a lot more pronounced in China than east-west because the difference between east-west is basically like nothing and like everything. So the north-south division is the more salient division. I actually don't know how it's divided. I know the climate is wildly different in Beijing to Shanghai and Hong Kong. Like Hong Kong is humid and hot all year round and Beijing 
actually has seasons, but beyond that, I didn't know there was a huge north-south divide. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. In the south, people mostly farm rice, and in the north, people farmed wheat. And so that, that created a lot of lifestyle differences, which obviously influenced the culture. As well, the languages in the north, it's mostly Mandarin. Uh -huh. But in the south, that's Cantonese. where these different dialects are very pronounced. And it's like in the southern, like more mountainous region, there is lots of pockets of dialects. Like Yu, which contains Cantonese, is like in the Guangzhou. Uh -huh. Is it Guangzhou? Uh, Guangzhou. In the, Aye, in I, the got, Guangzhou. I, got, I got one word you did. The... Hey, I'm, I'm proud of me. I'm proud of me. I got one pronunciation. That is that is not on your list. But yeah, sorry. Guang Guangzhou is the huge city yes. just north of uh, Hong Kong. To clarify, Guangzhou. I, that's 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 how every China YouTuber I've ever watched says it. And I assume because they live in Guangzhou that they're telling the truth. Like Guangzhou. So yeah. The Z's almost pronounced. Anyway, yeah. In go. the Guangzhou, in the <laughs> so in the Guangzhou province, there's like the Yu dialect, which contains Cantonese, which is obviously named after Canton, which is what the city of Guangzhou used to be called. Uh huh. There's also Hakka dialect, which is, it's very prominent in Taiwan. And next to it is Min, which is also in Taiwan. So by Taiwan, you mean the province of China, right? The autonomous region of China that is, uh, sometimes pretends to be its own country, but of course belongs to the, the great China. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened was the Chinese people from Southern China mostly moved to Taiwan. There were usually people who spoke Hakka and Min dialect, uh -huh. but what happens is the central government in in Taiwan will use Mandarin the same as the, t the government in Beijing will use Mandarin because that's considered the official dialect that's used for for neutral purposes because you can't use Min or Hakka because people only speak one of them they don't speak both of them but everyone speaks Mandarin and thus that's the language administration is it comparable to how India has two major languages and then English is the bridge language between the two of them yeah India has two major language families the Dravidian and the Indic languages the Dravidians don't like the to use the Indo-Aryan languages, which is also called Indic, um, because, I don't know. <laughs> oh. But English is a lot more neutral, and thus it doesn't create local divisions, and thus they end up using English even though it's a, a foreign language. Yeah, foreign language of a power, they have a questionable relationship with it sometimes, but I think that shows the power of English. To go back to the Canada thing, it's kind of the same thing of like, if you have a neutral language that everyone can communicate with, that's more important than deciding what the language is, right? That tends to be the way things happen. And in China, the way this works is it's Mandarin. But the people who don't speak Mandarin, obviously they are inconvenienced by this and it tends to be seen as the rule by the central Beijing dialect and thus it can cause issues. And in people who don't even speak any Chinese languages, that can cause even more issues. Uh -huh. Like for instance, Tibet. The Sino-Tibetan language family there are related languages, but Tibetan is not a Sinitic language in the same way that Cantonese is a Sinitic language. And thus there's even bigger drifts with that. And with Xinjiang, the Uyghurs speak a Turkic language. They wouldn't be considered East Asian like the rest of China. They, they would be a Central Asian country. They'd be full on like a Kyrgyzstan, a Tajik, like they'd be one of those countries, you know? They, they'd fit in with one of those Stan countries yeah. far more than they fit in with China. Xinjiangistan. Yeah, that area was actually one of the historical limits of China as they tended to have issues expanding past the Xinjiang area. Like they did under the Tang Dynasty managed to get into Central Asia where they fought the Islamic Caliphates in the Battle of Talis. But shortly after that happened, a general from that region called An Lushan started a rebellion against the Tang, which resulted in something crazy, like a significant chunk of the entire world's population dying during that war. And the Tang managed to survive it, but they never recovered to their former extent after that happened. And eventually they did collapse as things tend to go in China, where in Romance of the Three Kingdoms, it starts by the empire long united must divide and the empire long divided must unite. And that tends to be the story of China. The empire long demanded must unite. That's beautiful. Yeah, it, that, that <laughs> was the opening of the romance of the three kingdoms, which is kind of like the historical epic of China from the ancient time. Man, when, like, I, I'm sure this isn't just me, but like China is a really hard country to keep track of as it goes back through time because it's not China, it's the different dynasties. And then before the, the dynasties, it's like, you know, the thing you just mentioned there. And it's insane. It's, it's hard to even keep track of like where this China was, these China precursors 
didn't have the same territory. They didn't really have the same goals. They didn't, you know, they fought the Islamic Caliphate at one point. And it's like, how how is this the same place well, yeah. that today does what it does, you know? Like, it. Uh, tell me if you disagree with this, but every other country, you can kind of follow it back a thousand years without too much difficulty. But it's impossible to do the same for China without really having to learn every single intricacy of each dynasty. Well, yeah. So, so like I said earlier, China is kind of like as if the Roman Empire fell apart, but then it just kept reforming itself and falling apart again. And everyone was kind of had to pretend they were still Roman during this entire time. In Europe, the Roman Empire did not keep forming itself. They tried, but it was kind of weird because they had a German Roman Empire with the Holy Roman Empire. And so that it, it kind of didn't work. The Holy Roman Empire. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's that that is a hard one to explain. Yeah, I mean, uh, okay, here's a here's a here's a fun debate because it's uh, one of if you're, if you're talking about history, it's one of the the best questions that can come up. Was the Holy Roman Empire Holy Roman or an empire? It was never because that's a trick question. <laughs> I've I've heard the debate that actually it kind of was a little holy and it kind of was Roman in the same way the Romans were and it kind of was an empire just a very federalized one. Like that fact's so widespread now that people start to argue against it. Yeah, yeah, so, I, I agree with you on that what, point. It, it, it kind of was all those things, especially in the beginning, towards the end. Oh yeah, the beginning, yeah. That's the reason why people yeah. say that is that towards the ending, it wasn't any of those things. Yeah, literally, yeah, none, none of them free. They they were warring with themselves so often that if that was an empire, they're, they're doing a very bad job at it, that's for sure. But to tie the Holy Roman Empire back into China, so the Holy Chinese Empire, as we shall now call it, reformed and unformed a bunch of times. And it, But it's made of so many components that are just foreign to most people to this day, right? Like, everyone knows some of the most famous provinces, like, oh yeah, everyone knows uh, Shanghai, everyone knows Beijing, or Hainan. That Hainan is the uh, Hawaii. Oh, that is the perfect callback. Of that China. is the perfect callback. Honestly, yeah, hi I've heard Hainan is actually a beautiful like play uh, place to go. They actually they pay a lot of influencers a lot of money to go and promote it to because it's um it's got an official tourism zone where you don't need visas to go and stuff like that. So if I ever go to Hainan, you'll know what the reason is why now. The thing about calling it the Hawaii of China is that it's like that Holy Roman, not Holy, not Roman, not Empire thing, where it's said so many times <laughs> that people start arguing against it. And apparently, apparently people who go to China say they really don't like Hainan. It's sort of like the elitist tourist opinion, sort of where like it's over touristed. So therefore the people who are in the know are like, oh no, that place doesn't, is not good. Yeah, I, um, I definitely experience this every now and then where like, Anything where there's lots of tourists is not very good for tourists to go. Because every single tourist experience you want is not one you want to share with a thousand people, most of whom are not very respectful. For instance, uh, you, do you know, I, I'm going to tell you now, you, you probably don't know this, where this is. Do you know those famous orange posts that you see in Japan all the time that everyone takes pictures next to? I have never heard of this thing before. So like, imagine a bunch of orange gates all next to each other so that it kind of looks like a tunnel off them. Oh, you're talking about the shrines? Yeah, it's a, it's a Pacific... The, I, don't, I don't know what they're called. The, yeah, the, the gates. <laughs> the, the, the gates. The Tory, the Tory gates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, there, there's all of these gates, and um, it's one of the most famous spots in the world. But if you've ever... Like, uh, it's the same with the Jesus Pillar in Brazil, but if you go to one of these places now, what it actually looks like is a thousand people with their phones out, and it's like, there is nothing special about this place anymore. This is the same as going to one of those boxes that they have in shopping centers, but, you know, and like, you know, where they can Photoshop you on something. It has the same significance in terms of where you were and what it was like. Even though it's like one of those elitist opinions, I think anywhere that is over-touristed ruins the entire point of it being a thing. Controversial take. It's kind of like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, where if you go there, the only thing you can see is a bunch of people doing that thing where they're pretending to put their hand on it to hold it up. Oh, yeah. Oh. And yeah, so now people take pictures of people taking pictures <laughs> as and then post that. <laughs> I do love that that's a thing. Uh, something else. Um, okay, this is, this is really silly and maybe offensive, but... If that's not what I do on this podcast by now, then I, I don't know what is. But going to China, it, it's true to a lesser extent in a lot of East Asia and Southeast Asia, but in China, it's the most pronounced I've ever seen it. When you are in uh, even Shanghai, the biggest city in China, right? By population? I think so. Okay, so even when you're in Shanghai, this giant megalopolis, bigger than any city in either of our continents, uh, by a huge margin too. It's one of the hubs of China, but still when I go there, 
It's like I am the one white person a lot of people will see that day in the inner city. And there are some Chinese people who look at you and stare you down like, what are you doing here, friend? And that's that's an authentic experience to me, you know? Like, no one no one knows why I'm here or what I'm doing, but they, they secretly don't like it. If that's not what you want from a foreign country, then I don't know what is. Yeah, China is still very closed, even though they're open. Yeah, it's very hard to get in. Moving there is extremely difficult. You can never be a permanent resident in any conceivable capacity. And that plays into the hukou system, where even if you're Chinese, you can't, like, move between Chinese provinces without being, like, an illegal immigrant, sort of. Because of the hukou system. Full circle. <laughs> yeah, the migrant workers from the rural areas that moved to the coasts, they were used in the um, Chinese, where it became the factory of the world. They actually had less rights than the usual Chinese person would if they were from, if they had a coastal hukou. And thus, they don't get, like, funding for going to school or any sort of social welfare programs, even the, the minimal amounts that the coastal areas gave to their own their own hukou holders. Uh -huh. And thus, it was very easy for the, the companies there to exploit these workers in order to pay them even lesser wages than they otherwise would have if they're using local. So there are these migrants within China that have a similar level of rights as you would as a foreigner. And that's either beautiful or terrible, depending on how you want to cut it. Like, it's... It's it's beautiful that you can have the same rights as a local, but it's terrible that, that local can have the same rights as a dreaded foreigner, right? They can be deported in the same way you could be deported. Uh -huh. But they'd be deported back to their home place, right? But the, the thing about China is that the concept of rights don't exactly mm -hmm. exist. So China tends to just ignore the fact that they could be deported and they never actually deport them unless they have a reason to. Like, for instance, if they're trying to clean out a Beijing sort of slum type of thing, they might end up just destroying all their, their inhabited locations and deporting them if they feel like it's convenient for that particular time period to do that. For foreigners in China, it could be the same in that they could just send them away and they can never have a permanent resident status. But also at the same time, the foreigners could actually end up being treated better because China needs to keep good relations with the people they are, the countries they are from. I, yeah, the, the whole game of trying to play the world is basically China's big talent, right? Like trying to respect the world while also exploiting the world, while also claiming they hate the world and that they're in direct opposition to the world, while also trying to steal uh, lots of different ideas and properties from the world. And they seem to balance all of those things surprisingly well, given how entirely oppositional they all are, right? China manages to do lots of things that sound like they're diametrically opposed to each other at the same time and be successful. Yeah, this is, that kind of reminds me of like the Sino-Soviet split, where it happened because after de-Stalinization, they were accusing the Soviets and other socialist countries of not being true socialists because like, you know, they had market economies or they were not fighting for America. But then China, for the course of the split, ends up aligning itself with America and adopting a market economy. But would you say it's a market economy? It really depends on the province. There's two different versions of three worlds theory. One is the Western version, which states that the first world is us. Um, capitalist economies that have like free markets. The second world was the Soviet Union, which was a planned economy. And now some provinces of China are still essentially planned economies. Like for instance, the steel industry is still owned by the Chinese government. And in the steel provinces, they still abundantly operate in a second world manner where the economy is planned. And of course, the third world in our definition is like the underdeveloped countries where there's not much economy, whether it's planned or uh -huh. market economy. Now, China has a different way of seeing this. And this actually explains why they can be a market economy and still think that they're the true communists. The first world are the imperialist cores. So this is America and the Soviet Union. They considered them the drivers of imperialism around the world. And China thought it was a victim of imperialism from both the Soviets and the Western powers. And the second world is the allies of the imperialists. So this would be the NATO, as well as the Warsaw Pact, who are both second world in this definition, as well as Japan, which is second world as an ally of the United States. Now, third world is everyone else, where the people who are victims of imperialism, essentially, and China is one of them in China's definition of the third world. And of course, in our definition of the three worlds theory, it was actually allies of the United States Allies of the Soviet Union, so like the Soviet Union and China and the Warsaw Pact were second world in our de estimation. And third world were actually the non-aligned countries. So Sweden was technically third world in the original definition. And the leader of the non-aligned movement was India, 
so they were technically like the capital of the third world countries. Basically. Wasn't the uh, I thought the founder of the non-aligned movement was uh, Taito from uh, Yugoslavia? No, that might actually be true. <laughs> oh, apologies. The thing about the non-aligned movement was that it was a bunch of people who didn't want to be aligned, all aligning together for their own reasons, cooperating, all aligning together to say no, stop, stop m messing with us. So there's probably a lot of founders. But anyway, yeah. So the three worlds theory is slightly different by our estimation and China's estimation. Oh yeah, so uh, here's the fun fact. We're both right. You thought it was just India. I thought it was just uh, Yugoslavia. It was just, it was the two of them combined. Like what a wacky pairing of countries, right? Yugoslavia and India getting together to make a, 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 a thing together. Like, what is this, a crossover episode? <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you got that joke. I'm, I was I was worried you wouldn't. But let's get them golden. I'm, that makes me happy. Um, no, like there, there's a lot of those situations where you have crossover episodes in cities in, in history, like that, like that time when the Tang Dynasty fought the Islamic Caliphate. Yeah, it is. Like that was a crossover episode, <laughs> right? It's, it's like, what are you guys doing in the same show? Oh well, it's a crossover episode. If you want another crossover episode that in, includes China, when Alexander the Great conquered the Persian Empire, they also conquered Afghanistan. And the Afghan Greek kingdom, the Greco-Bactrian kingdom, it lasted longer than all the other ones. Like, the Greeks controlled Afghanistan longer than they controlled Greece. The really the Greeks controlled Afghanistan longer than they controlled Greece. That is insane. The Macedonian kingdoms, they fell to the Roman Empire before the, the Greco-Bactrian kingdom fell. And the Greco-Bactrian kingdom also expanded into being the Indo-Greek kingdom, uh -huh. um, which lasted until 10 AD which means it lasted longer than the Ptolemaic Egypt as the other Greek kingdom in the West. So the Greek kingdoms in the East lasted longer than the Greek kingdoms in the West. It's uh, it's like the Roman Empire, but again, it's the exact same situation, the exact same story. Actually, yes, that's exactly the situation. But then even further East. And they lasted long enough that Hellenistic philosophy managed to make its imprint on Buddhism. And thus it was the Greco-Buddhism that the Greco-Bactrian kingdom developed that ended up eventually spreading into China and thus the Buddhism in China is Greco-Buddhism, essentially. That was then uh, developed Chinese characteristics, obviously. Buddhism with Chinese characteristics? Heck yeah, sign me up. <laughs> the Greeks and the Chinese ended up fighting a war over heavenly horses, as they apparently liked the horses the Greeks had a lot and they wanted some. I cannot imagine. So it was a very brief period of time when Greeks and Chinese were fighting. The Greeks and the Chinese managed to fight over something. Heavenly horses too, of all things. That sounds like a fan fiction, a really bad fan fiction. That doesn't even, like, you could, you could be describing some weird, you know, like, thing you're reading on a fan fiction site. It, it would have just as much bearing on my life, you know? That is insane. The way I see Chinese history, it's kind of like DLC for world history. <laughs> that's a pretty, that's a pretty good way to put it, actually. That's a pretty good way to put it. Uh, I, I feel like we need to talk at least some amount, though, about Hong Kong, Macau, and... Maybe even like the free ports of China, you know, like Shenzhen and stuff, because Hong Kong is a wacky place, right? Have what well, have you have you been? Have you uh, met someone from Hong Kong? What's your what's your uh, exposure to the great city? There's obviously a lot of immigrants from that area in Canada, so I probably have met people from Hong Kong, even though I didn't I didn't necessarily know if they were Chinese from Hong Kong or Chinese from anywhere else. It's weird because a lot of them call themselves Chinese. And a lot of them call themselves Hong Kongers, and you have no way of knowing, you know, which one they necessarily are, right? Yeah, actually, something that's interesting is like 300,000 people who have Hong Kong citizenship are also Canadian citizens, and thus like 4% of Hong Kong is Canadian. So is that people, 4% of people from Hong Kong are in Canada, or 4% of people in Hong Kong are Canadian also? 4% of the people in Hong Kong are Canadian citizens. Does that mean they were born in Can Canada and have moved back to Hong Kong? They How does that either work? they were born in Canada or moved to Hong Kong or their parents had Canadian citizenship for whatever reason and they had their children in Hong Kong who still retain the Canadian citizenship be because uh, they got it from their parents. I've had this idea for a while now and this is a really stupid tangent but if you wanted to have kids with someone and ensure that you, you and that person had the best dual national kid what would be the best two countries in the world to have child with like would it be like the US and China or do you think you got to go more classic like you know Great Britain and Singapore what, what like do you take the two how do you think you get the most powerful child passport in the world so here's the thing 
the Chinese do not recognize dual citizenship. Oh, do they not? Oops. No. So with that in case, you can't really have a Chinese dual citizenship. The Chinese won't recognize it. They'll think you're just Chinese or you're just American. So which American can be Hong good Kong? in some ways or not good in other ways. Yeah, I think yeah, dual citizenship's are messy if they don't recognize it. Yeah, very messy. So as a result, the Chinese citizenship is not very good to have if you're trying to double it up. I think that having something where you have access to the EU is good for one of the citizenships and American citizenship as the other one. But here's the thing, American citizenship can have drawbacks because if you're an American citizen, no matter where you live, you have to pay U.S. income taxes. Oh, that is that is the most ridiculous true fact in the world. Yeah, it's um, you you pay it no matter where you live in the world until you give up your U.S. passport, right? Yeah. And I think to be fair though, that's because I mean, like, there's a part of, I I hate that. It sounds ridiculous to tax your citizens overseas in the world. I think the U.S. is the only major country that does it, right? Yeah, I think they're the only country that even could do that. Yeah, because they're the... because the American citizenship <laughs> is so valuable that people will keep it even though they had to pay taxes. Yeah, that was my kind of point. You're basically paying a yearly fee, like you're paying a subscription fee to America at that point, you know? Yeah, which is pretty much. If, if I could pay, you know, 1% of my income, something like that, I think it is, and be American, it'd make my life like 1% easier, I would say at least. Well, the thing about that, it wouldn't be 1%. It would be the entirety of the US taxes that are higher than your local taxes. I think that I think that's how it works. Ah, but in the UK, our local taxes are higher than the US's because healthcare and stuff, right? And I mean, it's not, I'm not actually directly that, but like something, 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 taxation model not being quite as progressive. But if I pay more taxes than I would in America, then are you saying there'd be no difference? Because I'm not sure that is how it works. I think what happens is you can deduct from your income the the amount you paid in taxes in the other country. I'm, I'm confirming uh, what you're saying right there, because that makes a lot of sense, what you just said. Most American expats do not owe US tax. Okay. Is it, but does it work where you can deduct the tax, the income you taxed from another country from your income to not pay the US tax? Is that how it works? It only works up to 102,000 US dollars. So if you earned more than that, you would still pay some US tax on the amount above that. And then here's the wacky thing. Obamacare would also apply to you. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's a weird that's a, niche. That, that's thing. something. Uh, <laughs> and if you, because you have to file a US tax return every year, you can get child tax credits, but also you have to pay more taxes because more depend. Jesus, how, how do, yeah, you're right. America's the only country that can get away with this and have anyone uh, actually do it. Also, here's a fun fact, just to, again, we can cut out the talking about the tax specifics because tax is a tax. But a fun fact I've learned after a bit of Googling after that bit that was, uh, you know, maybe just cut right now, is that if you actually cut your citizenship, you actually don't immediately have to stop paying US taxes. You can still be caught up to for the next five years, which is insane to me. No other country could even pretend to enforce that, right? No other country. <laughs> uh, okay. It's, it's... That is insane. Fun fact. So, okay, we, we're gonna pick two countries. You reckon one has to be EU, and one has to be like a powerful non-EU country. Probably the US, right? But if, excluding the income thing. No, it has to be the US. Okay. So what you're saying is, as long as the UK is a member of the EU, I need to find myself an American wife, and I need to have a kid. And then we can make a mega passport baby. That's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. You better get on that, toy cat. Well, I mean, uh, I need to up my American dating game, apparently. Uh, clearly. <laughs> That was a fun, fun little tangent. I like that. Yeah, I, I feel like Hong Konger is a really interesting thing because it clearly is its own place, while the people there are clearly Chinese ethnically, right? In a in a way, I you don't see in many other parts of the world where the ethnicity lines up with something and the nationality is its own thing. Because as as someone who's been to Hong Kong, I can confirm it's wildly British, like in intensely British over there, like in terms of how they built so much of it. But yet, at the same time, it's also wildly Chinese. Hong Kong speaks Cantonese, which makes it slightly different than Mandarin China. But the area immediately adjacent to Hong Kong also speaks Cantonese. It's just that it's not the official language there. Yeah, whereas... So in yeah, Hong you... Kong, Cantonese is the official language. It's That's one of the things that makes it so distinguished, is that even though they're all Chinese, they're uh, Han Chinese, right? The ethnic term, they're Cantonese speaking. And therefore, when mainland Chinese people go there and vice versa, it can be a bit confusing, right? Yeah. 
in the way that it's intensely British, part of that is that a lot of them that are there are citizens of, of the Commonwealth countries like Canada. And Australia and New Zealand. Yeah, like a significant chunk of the population of Hong Kong have Commonwealth citizenship or American citizenship. Oh, American citizenship too. I, I can't picture a Hong Kongese person in America, but I can in Canada for some reason. 4% of Hong Kong's population, 300,000 people, are Canadian citizens, mostly of Chinese descent and born in Canada. 1.4% are Australian and 1.1% are Americans. So even though a significant enough percentage of Hong Kongers are Americans, not a significant percentage of Americans are Hong Kongers because of the size difference there. Yeah. Okay. And it, it's just that America is just so large that of not, there's a lot of Americans there. These people who are held Western citizenships, they can be ethnically Chinese. And I think the majority of them are ethnically Chinese. The majority of them are ethnically... The majority of Hong Kongers with Western citizenship are ethnically Chinese. Yeah, as opposed to white Hong Kongers that... No, wait, as opposed to what, sorry? As opposed to white Hong Kongers. There, there are white Hong Kongers, but the majority of Western Hong Kongers are ethnically Chinese. I know my brain just isn't taking that in. Can you give it one more try and then we'll just leave it to history, if not. Okay, so the overseas Chinese population that lives in the West are mostly descended from Hakka and Cantonese speaking peoples from the south of China. Gotcha, yep. They would go to Canada, Australia, and America. Uh-huh. And some of them would come back. Like, for instance, the father of modern China, Sun Yat-sen, he was educated in Hawaii and became a Christian. And then he would, would go back to overthrow the Qing and establish the Republic of China. And both the, both the nationalist Kuomintang, which now controls Ch Taiwan, and the Ch Communist Party of China, they both respect Sun Yat-sen as the father of modern China. I, yeah, that's, I still, I, that's always one of those wackiest facts where like, yeah, they, they both have the same kind of like visionary, which you don't see in most other nationalist splits. It's usually like two separate people, both which are vying for it. What I think is even wackier than that, though, because the obviously both uh, both sides of that war stopped fighting so they could uh, stop Japan from invading. Right? That's the that's the World War Two angle on China. Yeah, that's not news. Yes, that that's part of something called Mao's United Front. Basically, um, Maoism uh -huh. um, is slightly different than regular communism in that it's Leninist, which says imperialism is the highest contradiction within the capitalist system, even more so than capitalism itself uh -huh. and thus combating imperialism is more important than combating capitalism and thus you can join up with anti-imperialist capitalists like the nationalist Kuomintang to fight imperialist Japanese and they also developed something called new democracy where if you look at the Chinese flag they have a big star which represents the communist party and four stars that represent four social classes within China and these classes are the peasants the proletariat the small business owners are petit bourgeois and the nationally based capitalists, which means the capitalists are contained within the Chinese flag. If you pay attention close to Chinese history, this is very similar to the four social classes of imperial China, which were the peasants, the artisans, the merchants, and the landlords. Now the landlords don't exist anymore because they were, um, well, let's say they're no longer with us. <laughs> very ominous. Anyway, so, so those are the capitalists now. The landlords became the, capital, the nationally based capitalists. The, the peasants are obviously the peasants. The proletariats are the artisans, because artisans, they make things. And the merchants are like the small business owners of the petite bourgeois. Uh huh. So it's actually socialism with Chinese characteristics. Socialism with Chinese characteristics. The most beautiful phrase I think you'll ever hear, if I'm not mistaken. So the, the united front that happened because of Mao, the fights back against Japan. I've always felt like, you know, looking at the history, the the communists did the, you know, the nationalists a little bit dirty and, you know, the way that kind of ended was kind of rough. But regardless, you know, the, the Kuomintang, uh, the Kuomintang? Kuom Kuomintang. Kuomintang. You can call it the KMT. The KMT, there we go. So the, the Kuomintang, the KMT, the because KMT. of my uh, lack of pronunciation of the Chinese words, um, you know, big political force from 100 years ago. The wacky thing to me is that when Taiwan converted from military autocracy to democracy uh, like 50 years ago the KMT uh, actually ran in those elections they won quite a few of them and now they're the major like right wing force on the island still like you can vote for the KMT and they often win a lot of seats 
Do you ever find it wacky when, like, a historic force like that that is, you know, famously not great in some ways gets... So, you know, like, you can still vote for the Communist Party of Russia and it's still the second biggest party, for instance, right? Is That, that's, that feels wrong to yeah. me. You know what's even weirder? The KMT, the Blue Party, which are the KMT, they're actually the more pro-China party in yeah, that election. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're the ones that want the, uh, the same relations of China, right? They don't want Taiwan independence. They want to keep yeah, the status quo. Because as Chinese nationalists, they ideologically agree with the one China policy. They just disagree about what they China. They there's one China. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they want to be the one in control of that China. But the Green Party, the Democratic Progressive Party, the DPP. What a beautiful name. They are Taiwanese nationalists. And thus they wish they could have their way. They would separate entirely from China. And I think this is the perfect way to, to tie everything together, to tie all the way back to that first comment. And... This, this brings us perfectly round full circle to that opening comment that the whole one China policy is why there are two Chinas and the KMT still existing and being the right wing that they are and being, you know, kind of in conserving the status quo. As a result of that, they both agree there's one China. They just disagree about who's China. And that's the fundamental reason we have two Chinas. Yes? Yes, that's exactly what it is. Except it's really four Chinas because Hong Kong it's very much not China. And Macau is very much not Hong Kong, even though it's quite similar to Hong Kong. And really, are Shenzhen and the other big coastal cities, are they really the same China? And is Tibet really China? You know, how many Chinas are there? Give me a, give me a number between one and ten, and let's settle this right now. There are ten dynasties and five kingdoms. <laughs> Wait, no. there, there are five kingdoms and ten dynasties. And therefore, really, it should be called one China five to ten systems am i right no that was just a reference to a period in chinese history called the five dynasties and ten kingdoms period there's also a 16 kingdoms period there was a three kingdoms period china actually has a habit of numbering things like for instance in the cultural revolution there's the three olds old ideas old what are the three olds can i make a joke that the reason they like numbering things is because they're good at maths or you know should we should we keep that <laughs> Um, <laughs> we, we, I don't know if we're going to keep that or not. I mean, that, that that's one of those that's one of those things where there's good offensive jokes and then there's just there's jokes that are that are good because they're Yeah, offensive. that was a really lazy joke that just happened and, to be um, offensive, right? Yeah. yeah, like there's a way you can make offensive jokes, but it has to be a joke primarily and offensive secondarily. And that was offensive primarily and a joke secondarily. To be fair, though, did it not make you laugh? It did make me but laugh. But why did it make you laugh? It did it's... make me laugh, but I'm just, I'm not sure it... See, you, does that mean, you, do you find racism funny? Is that what that is? Well, who, well, <laughs> who doesn't, honestly? The thing about jokes is they tend to be, like, unexpected uh -huh. things, and thus, if racism is a bad thing, it thus makes racist jokes funny. So what you're saying is when racist jokes become unfunny because is when bad. racism is expected. So really, we should hope that racist jokes continue to remain funny as long as you can joke about things it's it's not serious and therefore it, you know is it, it, things aren't aren't gonna go bad okay this segment needs to remain in by the way this is beautiful this is this is gold cream of the crop okay i can take all the blame for insulting china because i've been uh, sucking up to them all episode it's fine for me to make one joke anyway so we can go back to the four olds it was old customs old cultures old habits and old ideas which is, these are all the things they were trying to eliminate. Uh -huh. In almost all the history, they named things after numbers. Like for instance, there was the 100 flowers campaign, which was when Mao asked for criticism, but then he got criticism and it made him angry. So then he, he arrested people. There's also the 100 years of shame, I th or whatever, what is it called? Is it shame? 100 years of humiliation, sorry. Yeah, the 100 years of humiliation. The actually, that one's the, the one case where it's not. It's not numbered. They call it the century of humiliation. Oh, that's why it's not so catchy. Yeah, it's not as catchy. Like, they, it's very catchy when they name things after numbers. Like, the one country, two systems. Oh, yeah. One the country. Four holds. The Hundred Flowers campaign. One belt, one road. One... Yeah, everything's got numbers. And that is why my joke earlier is hilarious. Not because it's racist. <laughs> Chinese language is, is like it uses a number and then it has like some sort of noun. Like, for instance, I kind of have an interesting like ancient genocides because like there's no one left to be really be upset about them so it's not as controversial uh-huh like for instance the yeah i love a good i love a good genocide in the 300s continue, continue, continue. like for instance there was an uprising of the five barbarians in like the 300s in china and this was after the three kingdoms period 
where there's a lot of war and thus the area was depopulated and Chinese leaders invited people across the Great Wall to come and settle and farm. Oh. And so there was five barbarian groups who may or may not actually have been barbarians. They may have been related to the Chinese, but they just called them barbarians because they didn't like them. And thus these groups, eventually they rose up and started their own kingdoms. And thus when the Chinese regained control, a Chinese general ordered that all the barbarians in China be killed. So five in Chinese is Wu, and thus the five barbarians are called the Wu Hu, and thus there was a Wu Hu genocide. Boo Hu. Yes, the Wu Hu. The genocide, the Wu Hu, and they were called. Oh, the, Wu Hu. They were called the Wu. Wait, the genocide's the Wu Hu genocide. The Wu Hu genocide. <laughs> yes, there was a Wu Hu genocide. <laughs> Wu Hu genocide. <laughs> Sorry, I can I just say I don't think we can end on a on a better topic. Can we just end this with woohoo genocide, and yeah, I, I think I think can we end on literally woohoo genocide, like l those words. <laughs> so if there's one thing you can take from the last fair number of minutes, it's that woohoo genocide is a factual statement.